the air with a first look at the intense emotion from a mother in pain and in grief about the frankly disturbing new video of her son's death in police custody at a hospital. Ahead, the brand new charges being handed down by a grand jury tonight. Plus, court just wrapping up in the last few minutes in Dominion's huge defamation case against Fox. By the company's telling a judge they don't even need a jury because all the evidence is such a slam dunk. What we're learning about that and Fox's new legal problems. And the new study shows a tick bite could mean stomach problems. The brand new way to get sick you may want to know about tonight. Plus, our team's going one on one with the lawyer of a man now charged with murdering his wife. A case that's getting folks' attention because of a joke he made on a game show you've heard of. We're going to explain that one in a little bit. And why lawyers are accusing Gwyneth Paltrow of, in their words, a disregard for people in a trial over a ski accident that has everybody pointing fingers. We'll take you inside the courtroom a little bit later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air with Ivo Otieno's mother in pain today after her son died in police custody while being admitted to a hospital, smothered to death, according to prosecutors. As she says, a grand jury's decision to indict 10 police officers and medical workers is a step in the right direction. But she says that's not making this situation any easier to process. Listen. When they took him into the hospital, I expected him to be taken care of and to come back home to us. I see the image of his smile. I was a handsome young man. She is clearly, clearly in pain here after video that NBC News has just obtained in the last few minutes, first released by the Washington Post overnight, showing the final moments of Otieno's life. We should warn you, the video is hard to watch, obviously. We are only going to show it to you once. It appears to show Otieno shackled, being pushed onto the ground just before 4.30 in the afternoon. At one point, you see he's being held down by as many, as what the Post describes as 10 Virginia deputies and medical staff for something like 11 minutes. At that point, you see him stop moving and medical workers start working on trying to resuscitate him. We should note that NBC News has not verified what was said as this was happening because there is no sound in that video, but we are hearing something else. Audio from the 911 call from that day. Listen. There's no pulse anymore. Is the patient aggressive or is he not? He's no, not he used to be aggressive, right? So they're trying to put him in restraints, then eventually he didn't, he's no longer breathing. Lawyers for two of the deputies and one of the hospital workers have said previously their clients are innocent. NBC News has also reached out to the hospital for comment. Marissa Parra is live for us outside the courthouse in Dinwiddie, Virginia. And Marissa, there is a lot happening here today on this. Multiple hearings, this grand jury meeting, the indictments that are coming down, and now this new interview with the victim's mother. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot happening here in Dinwiddie in the greater Richmond area. Dinwiddie is just south of Richmond for those who don't know. But here uh, at the Dinwiddie courthouse, we had the grand jury who met behind closed doors. And then we had the public hearings. And I had a chance to sit in on those. But remember the context here, all of this on the same day that the public is seeing for the very first time those images from Otieno's final moments, as well as hearing those emergency calls that were made with dispatch. And what you also heard when we were listening to the audio ourselves is you could hear the frustration between the caller and the dispatcher because they were waiting and wanting for a response to be faster. Um, and so those are things that we're obviously still sifting through. But in terms of what we were able to hear in court, um, there was the bond hearings, there was the status hearings, um, and a lot of that is just routine setting court dates that are coming up. But in those bond hearings, we did also hear some new details from the defense of some of those deputies as well as some of the hospital workers. And something that we've heard before, we heard last week from defense of others, is what they were saying is the reason that they felt they needed to respond the way they did is because he, Otieno, was combative with them. And so they were laying out their defense saying why they believe that their clients were not guilty and why they think that should, they should get bond, which they did. Um, and then, Hallie, of course, there was the motion over that video that has already caused so much commotion over the last week even. 
It, it, I want to talk about that video in a second, but let me go back to that interview uh, that was conducted with one of our correspondents, Katie Beck, who's also on this story, and Otieno's mother, um, where, you know, she, and she has talked about this. She had said that she felt like her son was being treated worse than a dog in this moment where he is in distress, having an issue. Um, and we're going to hear more from the family, from the representatives for the family, in just about 55 minutes or so from now. Yes. And, and we know that they have said repeatedly over the last week um, that she knew that her son was having a moment that needed addressing by people who specialized in mental health training. And that has been something the family has echoed over and over. I spoke to neighbors of Otieno as well, and, and they said that they knew that this was something that he struggled with. And so ultimately, I think that kind of brings everything full circle here is I think regardless of where you stand on how this should have been handled, I think the one resounding consensus is this was a man who was having a mental health crisis and he was faced, you know, with people who didn't know how to handle someone having a mental health crisis, Hallie. We talked about that surveillance video, Marissa, the video that has just been mm -hmm. obtained by NBC News in the last couple of minutes here. In so many of these cases, again and again, when it comes to people dying uh, while they are in police custody, it is the video that seems to be so impactful. Uh, in this case appears to be at this point no different. I mean, that video really is the, the center um, of, of this whole piece. We know that that's been the focal point. The defense said that they're disappointed that it was released. They were worried that it would taint a jury pool, um, and they were trying to file a motion to prevent it being released. And in that video, you do see the number of people that are on Otieno at one point. You couldn't even see Otieno underneath them. Again, it doesn't have audio, but you do have that visual there. So, Hallie, they did try, and we're out of time here, but they did try to prevent that from being released, and they were unsuccessful in doing so. Marissa Parra, live for us there in Virginia, just outside Richmond. Thank you very much. Let's take you out west where California tonight is getting hammered by another storm right now, fueled by, you guessed it, this atmospheric river. That's what the meteorologists call it. It's this sort of system that brings in tons of rain, a lot of wind. It is the 12th such system to hit California this year alone. It's the southern part of the state getting slammed right now. Already there's a ton of flooding on the road that makes driving dangerous. Look at this freeway we're about to show you just north of L. LA. A car is sliding around. It's almost spinning out. I mean, that's what conditions are like as we speak. I want to bring in Scott Cohn, who's live for us in Los Angeles. Bring us up to speed, Scott. Yeah, Hallie, uh, as you can see, it is not raining right now in Los Angeles, but take a look at the LA River, which you are probably used to seeing in uh, car chase scenes and movies and the like, but obviously they're not doing anything like that here. This is some of the runoff from the earlier rains, and we are expecting that uh, this lull is going to go away and we're going to get the next wave of rains in the next hour or two accompanied by high winds. They're already hitting other parts of the state. Uh, they've, they've had uh, uh, people sheltering in place up north in Santa Cruz, uh, and that sort of works its way south. And the concern here is that we have had now 12 atmospheric rivers. Everything is saturated. That means the trees will be coming down in this wind. That means power outages. And of course, there's been a huge amount of property damage into the billions of dollars. 13 deaths in Southern California thus far on top of nearly two dozen in Northern California from the floods earlier this year. It has been a very, very difficult winter now stretching into spring. Hallie. Scott Cohen live for us there in LA. More rain to come. I know, Scott, I am sure I'm glad you're getting a bit of a break, at least for the moment. Appreciate it. A big demonstration is happening tonight as we speak in that state with teachers and school workers getting ready to strike. They're actually striking now. The school workers are. The teachers are standing in solidarity with them, shutting down one of the biggest school districts in the country. More than 400,000 students in LA not in class today. They probably won't be back in class for days. You've got 30,000 workers in LA. We're talking bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, teachers' aides. They are striking. They want more money from the school district. The teachers are standing behind them. They're saying they are not going to cross the picket line. Listen. Stand united, 65,000 members strong until LAUSD and Superintendent Alberto Carvalho give respect to the education workers that keep our schools running. 
That gives you a bit of the flavor of what it's like. And here is a bit of the flavor of what the union wants here. They want more money here. They make an annual average salary of $25,000. You've heard some of these people on strike say, hey, I could make more money working at a fast food restaurant. I want to show you some live pictures now of what it looks like as we speak. Out in L.A., you can see people getting ready now for this demonstration. Mara Barrett is there. She is live in L.A. Uh, the district says that they are still giving out, for example, free lunches, free meals, considering that three quarters of the students in this L.A. school district live at or below the poverty line. This is going to have this strike, obviously, big impact for the for the workers on strike, but big impact for kids and families, too. Yeah, Hallie, and we've been battling storms, as you heard from Scott, all day. And despite that rain, we've seen thousands of demonstrators come out here. The street is shut down uh, just outside the L.A. Uh, Unified School District headquarters because they have that passion for the things that they think that, that they want, that they deserve. And 75 percent of the student population struggles and is on or below the poverty line. Those students, many of them, are the, the children of the workers, the support staff, the custodians, the bus drivers, uh, the student aides that make us day-to-day -day school day go smoothly. And the district recognizes that. They say that they want to come to a fair uh, contract with these workers, but it's been a process of the last 11 months. They haven't been able to come to an agreement, and that's why you see this passion out here today. I want you to hear some of the conversations we had from workers who are striking, pleading the superintendent and the district to hear them. Please invest in us because we are worth it, Mr. Mr. Cavallo. We're, we're worth it. Our uh, SEIU workers deserve to be taken care of so that their students can be successful, too. Something really needs to be done, and this is, I guess, where we are. And just before we came on the air with you, Hallie, the superintendent releasing a statement saying they're, quote, ready to return to negotiations, seemingly saying that but we don't know if negotiations have been going ongoing today. They stalled late last night. But as long as there is not a deal reached, they plan to keep striking at least through Thursday this week, Hallie, which means students will remain out of school at least until then. And then what happens after that? Do they for sure go back Friday? Do we not know yet? You mentioned how negotiations seem to be at a bit of a standstill. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of indication that'll change, although the education secretary here in Washington told me just last week they are hopeful they will get to some kind of a resolution soon. And it seems like both sides here are hopeful as well, but I spoke to one teacher who said he's not confident in them reaching a deal because of the hesitancy they're seeing from the superintendent, the lack of action they're seeing in person versus what he's saying online is what they tell me. And as a reminder, the union is asking for a 30% increase in their wages. The district has come back and said, we'll give you a 23% increase over several years, plus added health benefits. But the union workers say that's not enough for them right now. So we're in touch. We have communication with the union and the district to understand what those conversations look like. As of now, the strike will go through Thursday, but there is a real possibility it could extend past that, Hallie. Maura Barrett, live for us on the ground there in L.A., watching all of that, of course, in the country's second biggest school district. Maura, thank you. So listen, I don't want to make any predictions here, but by the time we're on the air tomorrow, we should be getting the first idea of the next steps in this grand jury investigation into former President Trump. Our sources say Manhattan grand jurors are going to meet again tomorrow as one of Mr. Trump's attorneys in a separate case is blasting the district attorney's star witness, Michael Cohen. Listen. I don't think that's where I, I want our party to be. And, and to be a sore loser and have to deal with a porn star and hush money, that's not where I want our party to be focused. That, of course, is not Mr. Trump's attorney. We will get to that. Sound bite you just heard in just a second coming up with Vaughn Hillier. That, of course, was one of uh, the top Republicans on Capitol Hill. But it comes as we're learning tonight that Michael Cohen has been advised not to go on TV until further notice, given what his attorney calls the sensitivity of the time period. Just in case something does go down, some indictment does happen potentially this week. Police both in New York and D.C. plus the feds are getting ready for the possibility of any protest. You're looking at a bunch of bike racks on the left near Capitol Hill on the right in Manhattan. Right now, not really much to say of substance as far as protests. Our team on the ground in Florida, for example, says only about a couple dozen demonstrators came to Mr. Trump's home, or at least the causeway outside of it, supporting him. You see them there. You also see our Vaughn Hilliard, who is joining us in West Palm Beach. And let me start with this interesting piece of information. Just to remind people, this is an investigation into... Uh, alleged hush money payments that the former president made to Stormy Daniels, uh, former adult film star here. The question is, did he break any laws, campaign finance laws? We don't know what this indictment will say. That's what's at issue. Michael Cohen has been like the key witness for the Manhattan DA. And now as we're like walking into the studio, we're finding out that Michael Cohen's attorney has told him, <laughs> 
please stop going on TV. Like, please, given everything that could happen in the next few days, help us understand that. Right, Hallie, because the grand jury has yet to actually charge the former president with any crime at this point. Those proceedings are still taking place. That grand jury we expect to meet back up tomorrow. Uh, the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, could potentially bring uh, additional witness or two or more. There is no timetable for this here. And that is why Michael Cohen, after uh, leaving Lower Manhattan yesterday, went and made some rounds where he started talking a little bit more about this. But of course, the district attorney is concerned about potentially this uh, impacting the jury and wants to let this process play out. When we're talking about Republicans, Republicans, though, nationally, you saw those supporters. We were just amid that crowd. There were a couple dozen of them that said that they came out to show their solidarity and support for Donald Trump, Hallie. But when you're hearing from national Republicans, like Mike Pence, you'll recall, this story first broke in 2018. And Mike Pence at the time called them baseless allegations. So it's difficult for him now to, all these years later, step away from those previous comments. Take uh, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Uh, just listen to him from earlier today to give you a sense of sort of where Republicans are nationally right now on this. This was personal money. This wasn't trying to hide. This was seven years ago, statute of limitation. And I think in your heart of hearts, you know, too, that you think this is just political. <laughs> For years now, Republicans have defended Donald Trump against what they say are Democratic prosecutorial efforts to undermine the Republican movement. Now, this is a very difficult moment as Donald Trump is a top polling here to win the Republican nomination again. You know, you make the point, and we heard it from Congressman McCall there just a minute ago in the introduction there. Um, there are some in the Republican Party who, like, don't want this to be the topic of conversation. It seems like despite the former president saying today was going to be the day he thought that maybe he would end up indicted, that obviously hasn't materialized, but neither really have the protests or demonstrations. And I want to be really transparent about that. You go to West Palm all the time. I used to go to... There's generally always a handful of people who are there along the Strip heading into Mar-a-Lago, right, on big days when they know the media is going to be around. It seems like we haven't seen much more of a critical mass beyond that at this point. Is that fair? Right. And you saw hardly anything in New York City. I mean, over the weekend, he called for protest, 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 in all caps, and that never manifested. Now, a couple of the folks who I talked to here said that they believed it was because uh, folks are fearful of something happening in a January 6th uh, type of a, of a play in which there are folks that become arrested. And we know that there are now nearly nine uh, or 1,000 folks who have been charged as part of the Capitol seize on January 6th. And so there's questions of how much of the support of Donald Trump online and outside is actually going to translate into protests were he to be indicted and charged, Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Lawyers for Dominion Voting Systems are, in just the last hour, finishing up the first day of trying to convince a judge that the evidence that they have on Fox News in the defamation lawsuit is so convincing, is such a slam dunk, that they don't even need a jury trial. That's what they want the judge to decide. Both sides are going to be back in court tomorrow. You know that Fox News and its parent company, Fox Corporation, are getting sued by Dominion after Dominion, an election tech company, said the network aired damaging and defamatory comments about them after the 2020 presidential election. Like conspiracy theory stuff, right? The idea that votes were switched to President Biden, the ties to the former head of Venezuela, et cetera. Fox, for its part, says that that's just free speech protected by the Constitution. It's happening as NBC News is confirming another layer to this, that a Fox News producer, Abby Grossberg, who worked with some of the network's biggest names, Maria Bartiromo, Tucker Carlson, is saying in a new lawsuit she was coerced into giving false testimony in this Dominion case. She also says the Fox in this suit was just a terrible place for a woman or anyone to work. The daily verbal abuse, a disregard for mental health, a very hostile work environment created by the higher-ups at the network. Her lawyers say she was manipulated, in their words, and used like a pawn so that these executives wouldn't get blamed for the network's coverage of Dominion. Fox is responding to all this, basically saying the allegations came after a bad performance review for Grossberg, for Grossberg rather, and that her claims are baseless. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is joining us now. So let's talk about the law. Uh, let's talk about the sort of bigger, broader case here. The defamation case is now in front of a judge. Dominion wants the judge to say, yeah, the evidence is so convincing we don't need a jury trial. The question at hand, part of it, is whether Fox put people on air who were just blatant biased. You've got the judge talking about one big Fox business personality, Lou Dobbs, 
asking questions about the fact that Dobbs regularly used the hashtag MAGA, the hashtag America First. Sounding a little bit skeptical in this exchange, Danny, that that in fact somebody like Lou Dobbs was a, you know, non-biased participant in the news given some of what he was doing online. How should we be reading this? What are the tea leaves here? If you're just playing the odds, then this motion, this request to, to deem liability established, is probably going to lose, if only because judges are loath to grant these motions. They want to give every party Can their you, day in court. Well, I'm sorry, Danny. I'm sorry. The deem liability is out. That's the lawyerly version of saying not go to a jury trial? Exactly right. Yeah, take the case. So basically the standard is the judge is going to think about it. Well, uh, are all the facts known? Nobody disputes the facts. Based on those facts, are there any issues of law? Can I decide all the issues of law? Because juries decide facts. The judge decides legal issues. Issues. And if there is nothing for a jury to consider on liability, then the judge can say, OK, then liability is established. We'll just go. The trial will only be on damages. That is not a place a defendant likes to be, is only having a trial on damages, knowing that liability has already been determined. And that's why, again, if you're just playing the odds, the judge is probably going to deny it, even though Dominion appears to have a pretty compelling case. If they lose here, it doesn't mean Dominion loses at all. It just That's means right. they proceed to trial. And, you know, there's some thought that if they get to put on the liability portion, it'll inflame a jury and it may even be better for Dominion. Is there any chance Fox tries to settle before it goes to a trial if it were to come to that? Uh, look, Fox can always make the business decision to settle the case and avoid the possibility of leaving it up to a jury, to a coin flip, and to all of the, the damages that a jury might heap on Fox if they're angry enough about what Fox did. Let me ask about that lawsuit from the producer that we mentioned, that producer, Abby Grossberg. We already um, knew about her from the texts that have come out in the discovery portion of the proceedings here. And there's this moment, this text exchange, where Maria Bartiromo writes to Grossberg, who was her producer at the time. She had just interviewed Donald Trump. She says, should we have just stayed the extra five minutes and spent some time on a peaceful transition? Grossberg responds, to be honest, our audience doesn't want to hear about a peaceful transition adding, I'm quoting here, they still have hope. Would it be realistic that Grossberg gets called as a witness in the Dominion suit? Is there a credibility question here, given that text exchange? Yes, and there would always be a credibility determination. I'm sure Grossberg would have an explanation for that text, as often people, text messages can be taken out of context, so she might have an explanation. But on the whole, Grossberg's complaint is a pretty standard employment discrimination complaint, and you're seeing a very standard response from the corporate defendant, which is, no, 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 this wasn't discrimination. This was a bad employee. That's the standard back and forth in a discrimination complaint. What makes Grossberg's complaint particularly interesting is near the end when she talks about being coerced into mm -hmm. giving what she describes as maybe misleading deposition testimony. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for watching this one. More to come on this, I know. Today, you've got TikTok trying to prove that the best defense is a good offense. With the TikTok CEO making his case to users in his own video posted on TikTok ahead of his appearance in front of Congress on Thursday. He is giving youthful chill vibes, I guess, with the hoodie. He's got the Capitol in the background. He's obviously here in D.C. Listen to what he says. Some politicians have started talking about banning TikTok. Now, this could take TikTok away from all 150 million of you. I'll be testifying before Congress later this week to share all that we're doing to protect Americans using the app and deliver on our mission to inspire creativity and to bring joy. It comes as the company is rolling out some new rules and standards spanning deep fakes, basically fake videos of private figures, meaning like not public people or young folks too. That's going to be banned. There, it is going to be okay to do deep fakes of people who are public figures only in certain contexts. Um, to give you an example, I look at this guy turning himself into a young Leonardo DiCaprio, complete with a toast and a head nod. That's it. Obviously, the meme that's very famous or infamous. TikTok says that kind of thing is okay for like artistic or educational uses, not for political or commercial endorsements. Ken Delanian is joining us now. Writ large, right? What seem it seems like part of the goal here for TikTok with this video, with this new with these new rules here, is to kind of make a case that like they got it. They can put some sort of boundaries in place on the app and continue to operate in the United States, even with all these calls now from politicians to ban them. 
Yeah, that's right, Helen. It's very clever because deep fakes are a growing concern, right? The technology is improving and people on all kinds of social media platforms are trying to figure out what they're going to do when people start making deep fakes that look a lot, look extremely realistic about other people, about celebrities. So what they're saying here is you can't, you can't make a deep fake of, of somebody who's not a public figure. It's got to be clear. Any deep fake has to be clearly labeled. And if you're using a public figure for satire or other kinds of reasons, it can't be to endorse a product or to, or to do some kind of real distortion of their political views. Um, of course, none of this, Hallie, none of this speaks to any of the fundamental concerns that the intelligence community has about TikTok, which is that it's owned by a Chinese company, which is legally bound to turn over data on demand to the Chinese military and could also use the algorithm to manipulate American public opinion. But there is a reality that the TikTok CEO is laying out here. We played it in that video. Did you catch it? He says more than 150 million Americans use TikTok. That's more than we thought like a month ago, right? You got a lot of businesses using them, small business, medium-sized businesses, 7,000 U.S., you know, people who work in the U.S. for various companies use it. It feels like he is trying to make the case here that TikTok is too big to ban, that it's just an intrinsic part now of everybody's social life and of their phones. I think you're absolutely right. They are playing chicken with the U.S. government and daring, daring the Biden administration to follow through with this plan to ban TikTok. What, what the Biden administration, of course, would hope is that they could just bite dance. The Chinese company could just sell the platform and it could continue as normal. But that's complicated for a lot of different reasons. And so you're absolutely right. This is this is really going to come to a head here. Do, do the Bi does the Biden administration really believe this is such a significant security threat that they're willing to deprive hundreds of millions of people of this platform, Hallie? Ken Delanian, thank you very much. We'll see how it goes this week. Coming up here on the show, Gwyneth Paltrow is in court today for this big he said, she said trial over an alleged ski crash. You see her there? There she is. We'll tell you when she could take the stand and what else went down today. Plus, allergy season's coming early this year. Have you noticed? It's way worse in some cities than others. We've got that new report coming up in our five things. Right now, actress Gwyneth Paltrow is sitting in a court in Utah as lawyers accuse her of having, in their words, a conscious disregard for people. The court is in a quick recess right now. But the claim came, you see Gwyneth Paltrow there during opening arguments on the first day of this high-profile trial between Paltrow and a guy who says that she hit and hurt him on a ski slope. Here's what's happening here, if you're not, like, deep into it all. It all has to do with this accident, this alleged crash at a ski resort in Utah back in 2016. Gwyneth Paltrow and another skier named Terry Sanderson smashed into each other on the slopes. The big question at the center of this, who hit who? In other words, who was the uphill skier? In 2019, Sanderson sued Paltrow, saying she knocked him down and then just left. Sanderson says he was left with a brain injury, with four broken ribs, had some other serious problems. But Paltrow's attorneys countersued, saying, no, no, he crashed into her, making it this he said, she said kind of thing. Listen to how the attorneys tell the story. She screams, then skis that into the back of Terry Sanderson. Male skier took her out from behind. Let's bring in Kathy Park, who has been following all this, following this trial. Um, there are a lot of questions here, right, about what we're finding out in court, what we expect to find out in court. And one question relates to, will Paltrow take the stand? Also, her husband and kids. There is a possibility that that happens here, too, right? Yeah, so uh, today is day one of what will likely be a week-long trial, Hallie. And today, as you mentioned, we heard the opening statements. And you heard there the attorney for the plaintiff in the situation, Terry Sanderson, who is claiming that Gwyneth Paltrow actually crashed into him uh, February of 2016. And as a result, is still suffering the consequences of this crash. Here's a little bit more from uh, earlier today. Take a listen. She knew that skiing that way, looking somewhere else, blindly skiing down a mountain by looking up and to the side was reckless. 
Meanwhile, Hallie Paltrow's attorney is saying, look, that is not exactly what happened. It was the other way around. Sanderson is the one who actually crashed into her, and she was actually pretty upset about it at the situation. You mentioned uh, her kids. Well, they were all there on the ski trip, and apparently they will be taking the stand at some point in the coming days, uh, corroborating her, um, her report. She was upset. She was visibly shaken. So they're going to be talking about how her their mother was doing at the time. So this is, once again, day one, so buckle up. Well, is there any reporting that we have, Kathy, or any analysis from some of the legal experts I know you're talking to on why Paltrow may have decided to take this to trial rather than just settle it here? Yeah, so Hallie, Gwyneth Paltrow, she is practically a household name, right? She is. She um, is. Oh, my, yeah. If she is not a household name, <laughs> Kathy, like, my God, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, she's an award-winning actress. Of course, everyone knows her for her lifestyle brand, Goop. Um, so she is essentially trying to set the record straight here. She has been kind of dragged through the mud in the past couple of years in her eyes, and she just wants to clear her name. And like I said, she is a powerful figure. She is an influencer now, and she's only countersuing for $1, so that kind of shows you what she's trying to mm. do at this point. Make a point, basically. Yep. Kathy Park, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, President Biden just created two new national monuments in the Southwest. That means the Spirit Mountain area in Nevada and the Kastner Range in Texas will be protected from any new development. We're talking about a half a million acres. Both sites are important ecologically. They're considered sacred to dozens of Native American tribes. Number two, the two candidates for Wisconsin's vacant Supreme Court seat meeting up for a debate today. Why are we talking about a state Supreme Court seat? Because this particular seat, this particular court, could have a huge impact on abortion access and next year's presidential election in the key state of Wisconsin. Remember, back in 2020, the Wisconsin Supreme Court was only one vote away from overturning Donald Trump's loss in that state. Number three, spring has officially sprung, and for a lot of people, that means allergy season is upon us. Brutal. And if you're wondering where the top three allergy suffering locations are, folks in Wichita, Dallas, and Scranton, PA, you have drawn the short straw this season, friends. Hate to say it. They're the top three allergy capitals in this country, according to some new rankings. Number four, the maker of sports gear Fanatics will replace Adidas as the next official uniform supplier of the NHL. They signed a 10-year deal that starts next year. It's going to be the first time that Fanatics branding is going to show up on an official uniform in pro sports. Number five, the circus making a big return this fall, specifically the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey. The reimagined greatest show on earth will feature a lot of performers, but notably none of what you see here. No elephants, no tigers. The show took down its tents back in 2017 after concerns about how circus animals were treated. Ticket sales drove way, way down. So thus the new reimagined circus, Sans Animals. So listen, if you're thinking about buying a house, there are some new statistics that show it could be a good time for that. Because for the first time in more than a decade, home prices are down. We're also finding out home sales are going up a lot. It's like the biggest spike since the start of the pandemic. It all happens before tomorrow's Fed decision. And yes, they could raise interest rates again, which means mortgage rates could go up again. Diana Olick is always here to translate what this means. So first time in 12 years that we're seeing home prices go down. Is that good news if you're looking to buy, bad news if you own, or is that overly simplistic? Okay, well, it depends if you're a buyer, you're a seller, whatever, right. what side of the, of the aisle you're on. But look, we haven't seen home prices drop, and they were only down 0.2%, but still, they were down for the first time, as you said, in over a decade. And that's because we saw this huge surge in demand in February. Now, the reason, and I'm going to get just complicated for a little second, okay. is mortgage rates. Everybody's super sensitive to mortgage rates. So what happened was rates came down pretty sharply in December and January, and that's when those contracts were signed on the sales that we now see in February, the closings. That's how they count them. So that was because of lower mortgage rates. They were down around 6%. Well, now they're back up again. We're getting close to 7% again, 6.75 right now. And depending, as you said, on what the Fed does tomorrow, we could see rates go even higher. That might pull back demand again. And so, you know, we have to wait and kind of see where rates end up in the next couple of months. But it just shows there is incredible demand out there 
when people can actually afford these homes. Now, the prices, they did pull back, but that's a median price. The realtors counted by medians, and that means that they could have been skewed by the type of home that was selling, which is generally now on the lower end because the luxury market is just not moving at all. So that may be why we've seen that down. When you look at other indexes of home prices, like repeat sales index, which show the same house selling at a different time, those are still up 5%. Price is still up from a year ago. So I hope that wasn't too complicated, but it's all about mortgage rates. That's all I can say, Holly. I would just appreciate you being able to put it in plain English, Diana, for even folks like me to be able to understand it. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Still to come here on the show, a new report calling London's police department racist, misogynistic, homophobic. It is as scathing as it sounds. We'll talk about what changes could be coming because of it when we take you overseas after a break. In the last couple of hours, we're getting the first reaction from the Pentagon to the Chinese president's attempt to act as sort of a peacemaker in Russia's war with Ukraine. With the Pentagon press secretary saying the whole U.S. defense strategy is based on trying to counter this friendship that is growing between Beijing and Moscow. Listen. We consider China to be the pacing challenge and that Russia is an acute threat. Xi Jinping will head back to China tomorrow, back to Beijing, after talking with his, in his words, dear friend, Vladimir Putin, after a day of pomp and circumstance and red carpets and document signing and all of what you're seeing. According to Russian state media, China thinks Russia is ready to, I'm quoting here, launch negotiations. What that means is not clear. But their joint statement spent more time slamming the U.S. for building up nuclear submarines. Slamming sanctions, agreeing that they're going to partner up on issues like oil. Kira Simmons is following all of it for us live from overseas. So our team of translators is giving us an idea of what Putin and Xi said at the summit today with the big takeaway. Both of them plan to cooperate. But if there is some kind of a plan for peace in Ukraine, they're not exactly tipping their hand. Is that a fair summation? Yeah, fair. I mean, you can look closely, if you like, for the next 24 hours, 48 hours, for as long as you like. You won't find a big new plan for peace. Uh, China suggested that they had a 12-point plan a week or two ago. They put forward a 12-point plan. We didn't see anything more about it today. We didn't even see a suggestion of a ceasefire. What we did see was President Xi saying that he will increase economic aid to Russia. What does that mean, uh, Hallie? You suggested it. Uh, more oil, uh, more gas, more trade, propping up Russia's economy. And of course, uh, giving China the opportunity for cheaper energy and economic opportunities. There was plenty more uh, a personal chemistry between the two men, too. President Xi inviting to President Putin to, to Beijing uh, for a reciprocal visit, and President Putin describing their talks as substantive. But if they did talk at all about the idea of China sending arms to Russia, they certainly weren't saying it publicly, Hallie. There was also a really interesting split screen, too, Kier, because as this meeting was happening in Moscow, right, Xi and Putin, you have the Japanese prime minister making this surprise visit to Ukraine. We're about to show it. He's laying flowers here. And this feels like an illustration, sort of very vividly and very visually, of the, the divide, right, that's growing between countries tied to the U.S. and countries tied to China and Russia. Yeah, that's why people are nervous, images like this. I mean, look, you've got the leader of... China uh, in Russia uh, and the leader of Japan in Ukraine. Those two leaders on two sides of the war uh, today. J just think about that. That is why people are concerned about the danger of escalating a global tensions. And you're right, you know, the this world appears to be dividing up into uh, two sides. Uh, it is going to worry people very, very deeply. In the end, though, of course, what the Prime Minister of Japan was doing was signaling that Western support and U.S. allies' support for Ukraine, and, and the West will say that is vital that that continues. Keir Simmons live for us in London. Keir, thank you. A big warning today to the police force of the place where you just saw Keir, one of the world's biggest cities. An independent report just out says the London PD has to change or get broken up because of deep-seated racism and misogyny and homophobia. Yes, this report is exactly as scathing as it sounds. We're talking about the biggest police department in the UK, known as the Met, 34,000 people on the force. And this review was commissioned after the rape 
and murder of Sarah Everard by a serving officer in March of 2021. This killing sparked protests with more women coming forward to say they'd been threatened or attacked while walking alone. The report says discrimination is tolerated. It's not dealt with. It's become baked into the system. And it is felt most acutely by those who cannot hide their differences from the white male norm, particularly people of color and women. The British prime minister today saying, listen, it's hard to be confident in the police after what's been happening lately. Trust in the police has been hugely damaged by the things that we've discovered over the Even past your trust. year. Even your trust. Everybody's trust. Ali Ruzi is joining us now. So, Ali, talk us through more about what's in this report, because there's a lot, right? I mean, it talks about widespread bullying of minority groups. There's a Muslim officer quoted in the report saying somebody left bacon in his boots inside his locker. This isn't this report paints a culture of not just one off incidents, but of something that is much more deep seated and endemic. Uh, that's right, Hallie. It's a damning report of Britain's biggest police forces tasked with protecting London, but it's failing its people. You know, it not only talks about uh, failing young women and children, uh, awful women, uh, treatment of them, the 363 pages of findings accused the Metropolitan Police Force of being broken, rotten, and guilty of institutional racism, misogyny, and homophobia. Um, uh, as you know, the report was born from the murder of Sarah Everard, who was kidnapped, raped, and murdered by Wayne Cousins, then a serving police officer. The report then brings to light the crimes of another police officer, David Garrick, who's been unmasked as one of the UK's most prolific sex offenders, guilty of 85 serious offences, including 48 rapes. And what's even more alarming, Hallie, is that it says it's probably not an isolated incident involving a couple of bad actors, because the review has found that there may be more officers like Cousins and Garrick. Uh, the report found that the female Female officers and staff are routinely face sexism and misogyny. There's this preliminary report out in October, Ali, that said that the department hadn't vetted and trained officers properly, that some officers were allowed to stay on the job even after they were accused of domestic abuse or racial harassment. Um, you talk about like what what has to change, what is going to change, how are they going to, and I think the critical question is, win back the trust of people in London, given what you even heard from the British Prime Minister today? That's right. Well, the report says that, the, that there's systematic and fundamental problems in how the Met is run. And the problem with the force is not the size, but inadequate management. And if they can't change themselves, then it may have to be disbanded. I mean, the report talks about that if the Met can't change itself after one of their police officers raped and killed a young woman, then nothing is going to change the Met. So something drastic has to be done, and it has to be done now. Ali Aruzi, thank you very much for that reporting. Coming up here on the show, some new guidance saying some unexplained stomach problems might be from a tick bite. We're going to break down what we know about this disease that is newly on people's radars and how it could be connected to climate change. Plus, one couple getting a really, really shocking surprise when they came home from a weekend trip. What they found on their doorstep that you're not going to believe. That's in the local. We've got some new guidance out today on the possible dangers of tick bites, with some people apparently getting sick to their stomach from a food allergy when they eat things like red meat, like animal products. There's this other report from the CDC that says tick-borne illnesses are going up, so more and more people are having problems from tick bites, especially in the Northeast. And if you're like, great, terrible timing, I get it, because right now the weather's getting warmer. Maybe you're getting outside more. Dr. Akshay Saral is joining us now. So wait, talk to me about this and I'm, I'm alpha gal syndrome, right? That's what it's called. It's very rare. It's new, but it, it affects people's stomach after they get bitten by a tick. Yeah, Hallie, so alpha-gal really is an allergy to red meat that it, our best guess is this develops after a tick bite. Um, so basically what happens mm. is you get bitten by a tick called a Lone Star tick. Uh, so about weeks to months after that. Is that like bigger or smaller than a deer tick, let's uh, say? You know, I'm actually not sure size-wise, um, but it looks pretty similar. Okay, okay. Um, so you same same tick precautions. But, you know, four to six weeks after you, after you get bitten, um, you may actually start to develop an allergy to red meat, where every time you eat beef or lamb, wow. you could get the typical hives and, and rash that you see with allergies. So you could have trouble breathing, you could 
different anaphylactic shock. But what we're learning today is you can actually only have stomach problems. Um, so a lot of patients are really just having, uh, you know, uh, abdominal pain or nausea or vomiting with no real answer being labeled as IBS. And the guidelines today from the really national group of stomach doctors saying, hey, wait a minute, let's test them for alpha-gal and see what, see what happens. Are we seeing more cases of people who are coming in and presenting with symptoms of alpha-gal? Exactly. And I think the more awareness of this, it it's, could just be an isolated stomach problem. And really the red flag symptom you want to watch for is, are you waking up in the middle of the night? Are you just having excruciating stomach pain? Are you having you know, nausea, vomiting? Because it, it, what's weird about this allergy, two, it's two to six hours after you eat something. Okay. That you start to have symptoms. And I think if, if you have a friend who has, you know, a peanut allergy, it's pretty immediate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what's making this a little bit more mysterious and a little bit more, f frankly, interesting. As you say, like, it could get misdiagnosed as IBS or maybe some other type of, you know, neuro, whatever. Um, are we seeing more of this because, like, we, we talk about the climate perspective a lot on this show. The climate change is a factor here, right? Explain, pull that thread, explain that for us. So, you know, as the a, as a weather gets warmer, ticks like warmer weather. And as the weather gets warmer, ticks are going to places they weren't normally going to, like Canada. Mm -hmm. um, they're also spending a lot more time not hibernating because it's warmer in places they already were. Um, so we talk a lot about, you know, climate change affecting allergies with a, a lot of pollen in the air. Now we're learning about how it can affect uh, tick diseases like Lyme disease or like alpha-gal. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, for those who have this, Am I going to be okay? I talked to the leading researcher, really the world expert on this field, uh, right before coming in. He said three to five years is what they're seeing. You're allergic for three to five years, but after that, if you keep a nice diet away from red meat, there's a chance of recovery. Do I love that you're calling the world's leading expert before you walk into the studio here? I do. Um, real quick precautions. I mean, it's just wear the long socks when you're hiking, check for tick bites. It's the usual tick stuff? It's the usual stuff. Okay. Dr. Sayal, great to see you in yeah. D.C. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. For our Northeast Bureau, Massachusetts police are looking for the mother of a newborn baby who was abandoned. Right here, on the doorstep of a couple, didn't know the baby, baby boy, was wrapped in blankets in a car seat, might have been outside for hours. This couple came home, obviously found the baby on their doorstep, called police, went to the hospital, the baby's recovering. Police are also reminding people of the Massachusetts safe haven law. It means that you can legally surrender infants at designated areas, like maybe a fire station, where there's immediate help for those kids. From our Southern Bureau, Team USA is going to play Team Japan in the finals of the World Baseball Classic tonight in Miami. A lot going on here. The U.S. could become the first repeat winners since Japan took the first two tournaments in 2006, 2009. Japan was extremely psyched to get to the finals when they beat Mexico. Big stuff. From our Western Bureau, looking for a new job? What about becoming a pro bear hugger? The New Mexico Department of Game and Fish is hiring one of them to join their conservation officer training program. The posting says applicants must be able to hike in strenuous conditions and have the courage to crawl into a bear den. If you do, you get rewarded with hugs from little baby bear cubs. If you're still interested, deadline to apply is March 30th. When we come back, a former Family Feud contestant now charged with murdering his wife. What he said about her on the show and what we know about his possible defense after a break. We are learning new details today about a possible defense from an Illinois man whose joke on a game show now seems to sound maybe a little more ominous since he's now being charged with murdering his wife. The moment we're talking about comes from Timothy Bleefnick's appearance on a 2019 episode of Family Feud. You know Family Feud. It's that game show where you come on with, like, your parents or your siblings or your cousins, whoever. You guess the top answers to questions to different surveys. You see if you can guess what response most people gave. Hello, so listen, Family Feud is supposed to be jokey, right? Like, that's the whole vibe of the show. But flash forward three years later. Police say Bleefnick, in February, broke into the home of his wife, who was a, he was estranged from by then, and shot her to death. Now, Bleefnick's attorney is speaking with NBC News just 48 hours before a grand jury convenes in this case. NBC's Maggie Vespa is joining us now. So, Maggie, I have to think that clip must have come up, right? What was the response to that from yeah. the attorney? Talk us through it and what else we're learning about how Bleefnick is going to try to prove that he didn't do it here. 
Yeah, we'll start with that clip, Hallie, because obviously that's the biggest part of this headline, the thing that's raising the most eyebrows. Bleef Nick's attorney, as you can imagine, very familiar with it. Again, she tells us that her client maintains his innocence from jail, where he is being held without bond in the murder of his estranged wife, Rebecca, in their Quincy, Illinois home last month. The same wife who four years ago, in 2019, he apologized to on Family Feud after giving that answer. And again, his attorney, very familiar with that clip. And this was her reaction. It's nothing. It is a game show. It is a silly answer to a silly question. And he it was an answer that was on the board. So I would really hope that a jury in our community would not convict somebody of first degree murder based upon an answer they gave on a game show four years before the murder. So again, Hallie, she was adamant. She wants to say that Bleefnik from jail maintaining his innocence and plans to plead not guilty. So that in mind, I asked her, what, if anything, does her client think happened to his estranged wife. And she said, you know, basically any number of things. She said this could have been, for instance, a burglary gone wrong. She says there have been a problem with prowlers in the area recently. So it seems like we can expect the defense to offer up sort of alternate theories as to what could have happened, which, as we know, they're not required to do but they often do to try to establish uh, doubt in the jury pool. Hallie. Right, the idea of reasonable doubt. Talk, talk through what we, what we do know, and there's not much of it about sort of the, the hard evidence in this case. Even the bond hearing where we might have seen a little bit more or gotten some clues or hints, if you will, was closed to the public when it happened. Um, talk us through what we know. Yeah, so it does seem like right now the prosecution and, and investigators and police are keeping a lot of their evidence under wraps, seemingly to try and not taint the jury pool at this point. But here's what we do know. We're told basically the couple was in the middle of a divorce, a contentious divorce. And during part of that, there were restraining orders filed back and forth that per belief attorney have since been dismissed, but filed again between both spouses on both sides. Police calling this an instance of domestic violence. Also, belief attorney saying that they from what they've seen so far, see this as a largely circumstantial case. And they're calling for the prosecution, which we, of course, can expect this down the line, but they want as soon as possible the prosecution to turn over everything like lab t uh, tests of the scene and the results of those tests. And his attorney, this is interesting, even called on investigators and prosecutors to test Bleefnik's Apple Watch, like getting down into the minutia of that to look at where he was and also his heart rate at the time the crime may have been committed. So they're really calling for all of that evidence to be turned over as soon as possible. Allie. Maggie Vespa, um, it, there's a lot to this. Thanks for being on top of it, Maggie. Appreciate it. That's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. So any moment now, we're going to hear more from the family of Ivo Otieno as a grand jury indicts 10 people for murder in connection to his death. What the new and frankly disturbing surveillance video shows about the last minutes of his life while he was in police custody. Plus, we're live in Los Angeles where school is out because of a huge three-day strike. But we're hearing about any progress on a deal to try to get kids back to class. And TikTok's CEO rolling out some new rules for people online. How he's trying to maybe kind of preempt what he knows will be tough questions on Capitol Hill later this week. Plus, a little bit of a glimmer of hope for home buyers after prices went down for the first time since Adele set fire to the rain on the Billboard charts more than a decade ago. But is that dip going to be short-lived ahead of the Fed's next meeting tomorrow? And in the backstory, a behind-the-scenes look at an in-depth investigation on a group tracking gay Catholic priests who may be on the dating apps. But Rome reporters learning about this secret push later in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and any moment now, the family of Ivo Otieno and the family's attorneys will be speaking after a Virginia grand jury indicted 10 people for second-degree murder in the death of the 28-year-old at a hospital while he was in police custody. It happened earlier this month. We're showing you a live shot here. These are reporters, members of the media, waiting for that news conference to begin. We're going to bring you the latest on what's said coming up in the next couple of minutes. But just this afternoon, not too long ago, Katie Beck sat down with Otieno's mother, who says the grand jury's decision is a step toward justice, but she says that's not making any of this any easier to process. Listen. When they took him into the hospital, I expected him to be taken care of and to come back home to us. <laughs> I see the image of his smile. 
Ivo was a handsome young man. NBC News has obtained the video of her son's final moments from the prosecutor in this case. We should warn you, it is hard to watch. The video, we're only going to show it once, okay? And it, it appears to show Otieno shackled. He's being pushed to the ground here. At one point, being held down by as many as 10 Virginia deputies and medical staff for several minutes. At one point later, he stops moving entirely, and then that's when medical workers try to resuscitate him. We should note that NBC News cannot confirm what was said as this was happening because that video has no sound. There's no audio on that video. But we do know that a prosecutor charged these seven sheriff's deputies and three hospital workers last week. Again, those indictments from a grand jury coming tonight. Lawyers for two of the deputies and one of the hospital workers have previously said their clients are innocent. NBC News has also reached out to the hospital for comment. Katie Beck is joining us now again. Katie, you spoke with Otieno's mother here. Talk about where this goes from here in a case that is getting so much attention in part because of the video, in part because of the accusation that he was basically smothered to death, prosecutors say. Well, Hallie, there's more to this story. We're seeing that 11 minutes that they say is when all of the worst of it happened to Otieno at that mental hospital where he lost his life and was smothered to death. But there is a chapter that precedes that and a chapter after that that is going to be subject to investigation. The chapter before that would be what happened behind me in the Henrico County Jail where he was transported from to that mental hospital. We've been told there's surveillance video that's been viewed by the family and the attorneys. And according to them, there is some abusive behavior that happens in a jail cell uh, before he is transported. So they, they're sort of trying to paint a picture of a systematic abuse that actually started in jail and then continued as he was transported and then finally ended uh, at the mental hospital after, as you said, these 10 people had, had smothered him. Uh, but beyond that, there are questions about how fast this response was, how fast they called the Virginia State Police. When someone dies in police custody, that phone call should happen almost immediately to the the outside supervising state agency to do the investigation. They waited quite a substantial amount of time, several hours before calling the VSP. Uh, so there will be questions about what they were doing during that time. Uh, were they trying to get stories in line? Were, were they moving evidence? Um, what was happening in that long period? So as I said, the investigation now will be focused on not only perhaps finding more video from inside the jail and finding more details from those that were there, uh, but also what was done after the fact and, and the response to that. Uh, today, we did hear some of the 911 call uh, from the hospital as they were trying to resuscitate Otieno. A warning to viewers, some of what you hear could be a bit disturbing. I'm There's sorry. no pulse anymore. Is the patient aggressive or is he not? He's no, not he used to be aggressive, right? So they're trying to put him in restraint. Then eventually he didn't, he's no longer breathing. So as you can hear in those minutes, uh, there was some effort to get emergency responders quickly there. Unfortunately, Helly, it was too late. One of the things that is just so striking about this case, and part of why it's getting such national attention, right, is because it is yet another person of color who has died now in police custody. Obviously, the circumstance is unique here, but you could just hear the pain and the grief in the voice of Otieno's mom that, when you spoke with her, Katie. Yeah, it was a very raw interview, as you heard. It, it, we, we unfortunately interview uh, parents who are grieving a lot, but this is a person who is still very much in the heart of disbelief. She said at some point she feels like her son could just walk right through the door. This is a son who has had a long history uh, with mental illness episodes and so far have always resolved in him coming back home. Um, and she says there are periods where he is, is very normal and has no episodes and, and sort of doesn't have any interaction um, it doesn't take any medications, um, but these incidents do occur, and she has been through them before, and she was expecting that at any minute, um, you know, she would hear from the hospital and be told what his treatment course was, and that she would certainly be seeing her son again. Um, here's a little bit from that interview, as you said, very emotional. I want those monsters, those animals that treated him so wrong and squeezed the life out of him. I want them brought to justice. 
Another thing she mentioned was that while they are grieving, they're feeling a great deal of relief that this video has seen the light of day and the public is able to see what they saw. She said, I was so outraged. I was so disheartened uh, by the way my, my son was treated that to describe it was never going to be enough to convey mm -hmm. to other people what actually happened. So despite the fact that defense attorneys in this case late yesterday actually filed a motion to try and block this video from being released, uh, the prosecutor really felt like it was necessary to get that out and did so overnight before a hearing could happen on that. Hallie. Katie Beck, live for us on this story. Katie, thank you for all the reporting that you've been doing. Appreciate it. In just the last couple of minutes, speaking of new reporting, our team is hearing from two senior officials who say the Secret Service is starting to make a plan if former President Trump is indicted. Now, these sources say there has been no security review done of the Manhattan courthouse where this would happen just yet, but they're walking through what they need to look at, stuff like what airport would Donald Trump fly into if he did have to come back to New York and face charges, et cetera? It's all happening, as we understand from sources, that the Manhattan grand jury is getting ready to meet again tomorrow. And just in case, police both in New York and D.C., along with the feds, they're getting ready for any possible protests. These are all the bike racks that are going up on the Hill and in New York. So far, our team on the ground says only about a couple dozen protesters, not even, you see him here, came to just outside Mr. Trump's home in Florida. And a couple hundred miles north in Orlando, you have other Republicans, like House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, defending Donald Trump and slamming the Manhattan District Attorney. Listen. This was personal money. This wasn't trying to hide. This was seven years ago, statute of limitation. And I think in your heart of hearts, you know, too, that you think this is just political. Vaughn Hilliard is live for us in West Palm Beach. And Vaughn, let me start with this new piece of reporting from our colleague Jonathan Deanst here, who, based on sources that he's talking to, um, he, the, the idea of a virtual arraignment for the former president. In other words, something where he could remain in Florida and be virtually arraigned if he is indicted, not come to New York, not have the whole thing happen there. Is that a part of the conversation yet? What do we know? Right. It's maybe a part of the conversation, but it would definitely be outside of the norm. Under New York state law, somebody has to show up and be arraigned in person in the state of New York when uh, charged on state crimes. Uh, there are other states where that is not the case. You can even waive your arraignment and you never have to show up for that initial appearance. But in the state of New York, under state law, it says you have to. But of course, we've never seen a former president of the United States indicted here, and it would be complicated. Of course, Donald Trump has not suggested that he would fight uh, a potential arraignment, and the expectation would be that he would leave West Palm or West Palm Beach here and fly uh, on his plane to New York, and that is at that point when the Secret Service, uh, uh, per Jonathan Dean's reporting would begin to evaluate the specifics. And at this point, Donald Trump has not been charged. The grand jury proceedings are slated to begin back up tomorrow afternoon. At that point, we should potentially get a better understanding of a timeline, Hallie. That will be the tea leaf reading that happens then, right, Vaughn? Once we know, is the grand jury talking to any more witnesses? Are they wrapping up? That will give us a better sense. But I think a lot of people in the law enforcement community in New York and in Florida on higher alert, based on the reporting from our team, for the potential for an indictment, maybe if it happens soon. Right. And Donald Trump is the one who predicted over the weekend that today he would be arrested. Right. Uh, of, obviously, that speculation never amounted to reality, and he had never even been charged at that point. And yet you saw dozens of supporters here in Mar-a-Lago. You didn't see much of a turnout in New York City. But you also see national leaders here around the country talking about this. You just played the bite from House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. You have seen the likes of even Ron DeSantis answer questions about his thoughts on the potential merit of the charges. I want to let you hear from another member of Congress. Congress, Mike McCall, here when he was asked by uh, uh, our uh, own NBC News reporter about the uh, concept of Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels being at the forefront of this news cycle here yet again. Take a listen. I don't think that's where I, I want our party to be. And, and to be a sore loser and have to deal with a porn star and hush money, that's not where I want our party to be focused. Of course, this is what Republicans are looking at here. Donald Trump is ahead by anywhere from about 30 to 40 percentage points in national polling uh, against uh, Republican rivals. And so he is at the top of their political fiefdom right now. And yet there is the potential that he could be the first uh, a, a president, former president ever indicted in American history. And that's the man that they may be attaching their cart to ahead. Allie?
Vaughn Hilliard uh, on alert there in West Palm Beach. Vaughn, thank you very much. Let's take you out west where California tonight is getting just hammered by another storm and a whole bunch of flooding because of yet another, you guessed it, atmospheric river. That's what the experts call this storm system that's moving through. The 12th one to hit California just in the last few months. Southern part of the state is going to be hit the hardest with the wind. You see it blowing here with a bunch of rain. You can see this freeway north of L.A. We're about to show you where a car, um, you see it right at the top of your screen. It starts to kind of spin out. I mean, right there on the highway, that's not obviously an ideal situation. Normally, this is just a creek. It is now overflowing with water. Scott Cohn is in Los Angeles. And Scott, um, I'm looking at your live shot here. No rain where you are, but that doesn't mean that no rain is going to be the operative status for the next couple of hours here. Right, Hallie, and the rain actually has started again. It's just a little bit. It was raining a lot more earlier today. Uh, but now this, uh, this atmospheric river storm is, I guess, getting a second wind, with wind being the operative phrase, as you alluded to. We're expecting uh, very high winds as this, as this second part of the storm comes through. You talked about a, a normally a creek now being a rushing river. That's the L.A. River which normally is, uh, is not much to, to, to see, but it really is something today. Uh, and we're expecting now uh, uh, many more inches of rain, particularly in the higher elevations, feet of snow, and winds that have already in the northern part of the state been, been gusting into the 70-mile-an-hour range. That's expected to show up here as well as this storm rushes through here uh, basically uh, now and into the night, Hallie. Scott Cohn, live for us there in Los Angeles. Scott, thank you very much. Appreciate it. We want to take you to L.A., not far from where Scott is, for a very different story. Hundreds of thousands of students getting ready for another day not in class because thousands of school workers, the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers, the custodians, the teacher's aides, they are on strike. You see some of the images here from a big rally that just wrapped up in the last couple of minutes outside district headquarters. Teachers say they are not going to cross the picket line in solidarity with this workers' union. So that's why kids are not in school, effectively shutting down the second biggest school district in the country. Watch. Enough is enough. That's right. If LAUSD truly values and is serious about reaching an agreement, they must show workers the respect they deserve. This is what the workers union wants. They have an average annual salary of $25,000. They want more money. You can see what the district is offering a little bit more over the next five years. The union wants more than that. The superintendent in just the last few minutes has put out a statement saying, I'm quoting here, they are ready to return to negotiations with the union. I want to bring in Maura Barrett, who's live for us in Los Angeles. We've just wrapped day one. Day two and three are ahead. Do we think we'll get to three days of this strike? Could they come to some kind of a deal? Is that a glimmer of hope there from the superintendent or just maybe, you know, wish thinking. Well, there's the openness to negotiate, right, Holly? At least that's what he's projecting uh, and tweeting about uh, and has spoken to cameras about. But when I was on the, he the ground here talking to protesters all day, you'll see the rem remnants of the demonstration behind me of day one. And they said that what he's saying publicly doesn't match with what they're hearing is being brought to the negotiation table. And that's what they're really frustrated by. I want you to hear from a few demonstrators, union workers who came out today. Thousands had filled the streets uh, in front of the L.A. Uh, school district's headquarters. And I want you to hear some of their frustrations. This is what you are dealing with because we care about the kids. It's high time we stop being disrespected. High time we stop being threatened in our jobs. Students are not a victim of this strike. We are in solidarity with it. One teacher I spoke to said he's hopeful but not overly confident that this will just be three days. He wants the union to be able to work with the district to come to an agreement. But like you heard, union workers say they feel disrespected. They tell me that their mental health is struggling because when they're making a salary that is just that it's way below the poverty line, way before, below the California minimum wage here, that puts a strain on their day-to-day -day life and what they can afford. And that's something that they're looking to see change, considering that the district says they recognize them as essential workers. Tally. Maura Bear, live for us there in Los Angeles. Maura, thank you very much. We want to get to some breaking news here on Capitol Hill, just into us in the last couple of minutes here. And it is an update on the top Republican in the Senate, who you'll remember was hospitalized nearly two weeks ago with a concussion and apparently a broken rib after he tripped and fell. We are now learning that Mitch McConnell is, in the words of his longtime political advisor, doing very well. 
Couple of pieces of news out of this new reporting. He's apparently been speaking to colleagues in the Senate on the phone. That's different because as of last week, it was mostly just on text. Nobody that we had known about had talked to him directly on the phone. There is no updated timetable, however, for when Mitch McConnell is going to get back to work as he continues to recover. Julie Serkin, our NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent, is joining us from Capitol Hill. It is a significant development. It had been, you know, I think mostly radio silence with intermittent updates over the last couple of weeks. And now here we are with more and more information coming out on how Mitch McConnell, again, one of the most powerful Republicans in the country, is doing. Yeah, Hallie, this is really notable because we haven't seen him in this building since March 8th. That's right before he went to that dinner where he suffered this fall and that led to him suffering a concussion where he's been recovering after being released from the hospital in a rehab facility with inpatient treatment for not only the concussion, but also a broken rib. Now we're having some positive news and we're hearing that from his colleagues who say they spoke to him by phone. That includes uh, his number two, Senator John Thune, who's been taking the helm while he's been in recovery. Uh, he told NBC that that the minority leader is, quote, eager to get back. He's doing good. I spoke to Senator Capito, who told me she also spoke with Senator McConnell, and he wants to get back. He was alert uh, and well, according to his longtime political advisor. But look, his absence was certainly felt here in the Senate. I spoke to some senators uh, who spoke to that, right? He's a very uh, big fixture, a notable uh, politician here up in the Senate. He has a lot of influence in how his party conducts business here, and it's really been noticeable absent that he hasn't been here. So again, uh, some positive developments. He's been talking to colleagues, not only just texting, but by phone as well. His longtime political advisor says he's doing better and is, quote, on track. No timetable, like you mentioned, to when we can see him back here. But remember, there are a couple weeks of recess coming up, so it could be a little bit of time, uh, potentially up until the end of April. Do we know, is he still in rehab, an inpatient rehab, Julie, or is he home? Yeah, McConnell is uh, apparently still in rehab. He's still okay. receiving inpatient services. Uh, that's all we know from his team. But again, like you mentioned, we have been getting only those incremental updates. The good news here is that some of them have been able to visit with him and actually spend some time with him today. And he is doing better according to them and according to senators. Uh, he's eager to get back here and do some work. Julie Sorkin live for us on the Hill. Julie, thank you very much for that breaking news, bringing it to us right here on NBC News Now. Today, TikTok's trying to prove maybe that the best defense is a good offense, with the head of TikTok making his case to users in a video posted on TikTok before his own appearance in front of Congress on Thursday. He's in jeans, he's in a hoodie, he's in Washington. You can see the Capitol, the, I think it's the monument in the background when his head moves out of the way. Take a listen. Some politicians have started talking about banning TikTok. Now, this could take TikTok away from all 150 million of you. I'll be testifying before Congress later this week to share all that we're doing to protect Americans using the app and deliver on our mission to inspire creativity and to bring joy. TikTok's rolling out some new rules today for content banning so-called deep fakes, like fake realistic looking videos of people who are not public figures, of people who are younger. Take a look at this guy, right? He turns himself into a young Leo DiCaprio. Um, you know the meme, the toast, the head nod meme? There he is. This is like, I guess, a pretty good deep fake. I don't know. Take your pick. Point is, TikTok says that that kind of content is okay for artistic or educational uses. They're not down with it for political or commercial endorsements. Ken Delanian is joining us now. And it feels like the point of this, taken writ large, Ken, is TikTok trying to make the case um, before they have to get hauled in front of Congress on Thursday, as we know this TikTok CEO will do, to say, we're doing what we can to put some rules and regulations in place to satisfy at least some of the concerns that you have. That's right, Hallie, and they're doing a very clever thing here. They're taking advantage of a growing concern about deep fakes. Look, deep fake, we're only at the beginning of the deep fake revolution, and we're gonna get to the point where anybody can appear in a video doing anything, whether they did it or not, whether they said it or not. It's really pernicious. Imagine a video of a celebrity saying something racist, and you can't even tell whether it's legit or not just by looking. You need technology to figure it out. That's where we're going, and TikTok is saying, no, we're banning that on our platform. It's not 100% clear to me exactly how they're going to do that using technology or, or what, but they're saying that they're taking a proactive stance and they're doing that. Um, and that's going to please a lot of people who are concerned about deepfakes. It's not, however, Hallie, going to address the security concerns that the U.S. intelligence community has 
with the fact that the TikTok platform is owned by a Chinese company uh, that is bound by law to turn data over to the Chinese military, and also, uh, Intel officials worry, has access to an algorithm and could inject propaganda into the American uh, bloodstream, essentially. There has been a desire from lawmakers, as you lay out, to ban TikTok entirely here in this country. If they did, like, I wonder, how much would it matter? India banned TikTok three years ago, but a report from Forbes says that troves of personal data of Indian citizens who once used TikTok remain widely accessible to employees at the company and to its Beijing-based parent company, ByteDance. So that's a great question. So you're right. The people who have already given up their data by putting the app on their phone, which is 150 million Americans, that data is gone. There's nothing anybody can do about that. What a ban would do, and again, it would be the Biden administration that has been right. empowered by announce, Congress right. already Congress to ban TikTok. Congress would empower the administration to do that, right? Yes, yes. What a ban would do would foreclose uh, the Chinese government in the worst nightmare scenario from having access to the algorithm and to suddenly, you know, spew videos with pro-China propaganda at, at hundreds of, you know, tens of millions of Americans. We've seen no evidence that that has happened so far, but that is the worst nightmare or, or a more subtle version of that where, you know, sun, suddenly videos are popping up with pro-China messages or in favor of some policy in the United States that China wants. A ban would, would prevent that from happening. It wouldn't save the data, though, of the people who are already using TikTok, Ali. Ken Delaney, and thank you very much. Appreciate it. So listen, by tomorrow, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, will be back in China, back in Beijing, after trying to kind of play peacemaker during his summit with, in his words, his good friend, Vladimir Putin. You see the two of them right in that screen. They're sitting down together. And according to Russian state media, China thinks Russia is ready to launch negotiations. I'm quoting. What that means? Kind of unclear. But the joint statement spent more time slamming the U.S. for building up nuclear submarines, attacking sanctions, and agreeing that they're going to partner up on stuff like oil. It's also creating an interesting split screen with what's happening today in Ukraine, with the Japanese prime minister visiting a church there. The Pentagon is praising that move today saying that it is a strong and symbolic signal of how the West and Western allies are standing up for Ukraine against Russia's war. This is, again, demonstrative of the international community's support for Ukraine uh, and, and demonstrating that the kinds of activities Russia has taken in terms of invading its peaceful, sovereign neighbor is unacceptable. Keir Simmons is covering for this, uh, covering this for us, I should say, live from overseas. And that split screen moment is an interesting one. The dynamic at play here, growing isolation between Russia, China, and the rest of the world, and then a lot of, uh, you know, the rest of the West, um, Western allies here on the other side of it. Well, that's right. And, you know, there will be those who will see that split screen, uh, Halley, with the leader of Japan in Ukraine and the leader of China in Russia. Uh, and they'll see that as somewhat worrying as the potential for global escalation of this war uh, in uh, Ukraine. It's certainly the case, I would say, that uh, Japanese prime minister isn't going to go to uh, Ukraine uh, without uh, the uh, you know, acquiescence, the agreement, the support of the U.S. You, you just know how close Japan and uh, the U.S. are as, as allies. So uh, perhaps the idea there was to have a, a, an image to set against the image of the Chinese leader with President Putin. The, the big concern, I think, heading into the summit from people here in the United States was the possibility that there would be some kind of a deal that China would send um, military help to Russia, lethal military aid to Russia, something that China had denied considering. Do we feel like, like, is the sense now as the summit is coming to a close that that possibility has been foreclosed upon? Is there some sort of sigh of relief from U.S. officials on that point yet or no? Well, I mean, they haven't mentioned it. So but that doesn't necessarily tell us that it hasn't been talked about. Certainly, of course, the Russians would like to have uh, more lethal military support from China. Frankly, uh, they appear to need it. Uh, what they did talk about, though, uh, Halley, is uh, more trade, uh, more economic uh, aid, if you like, from China. What does that mean? It means uh, increased sales of oil, increased sales of gas, uh, increased trade, and, and that will be propping up the Russian economy and also allowing China to benefit from, from cheaper energy and yeah. economic opportunities. And, and just in 
that announcement, in that fact, you can see why, why these two countries are, are turning to each other, perhaps they, because they have no choice, but also because they can see multiple benefits, particularly for China. In many ways, President Putin hasn't got anywhere else to turn. Keir Simmons, live for us in London. Thank you very much, Keir. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, superstar Gwyneth Paltrow is trying to defend herself in a Utah courtroom today. Day one of a trial that's very high profile, while she's being accused of a conscious disregard for people. Plus, another type of lab-grown meat could be showing up at a grocery store near you soon. Pretty big decision from the FDA coming up in The Five Things. Coming up in the five things, why federal regulators are looking into a certain type of Honda car, one that a lot of people drive. But first, right now, actress Gwyneth Paltrow is sitting in court in Utah, far from Hollywood, with lawyers accusing her of being, in their words, distracted and having a conscious disregard for people in this high-profile He Said, She Said trial. This is a live look right now inside the courtroom. The second witness on day one of this trial is on the stand. It's between Paltrow and a guy who says that she hit and hurt him on a ski slope. Here's the deal. It all has to do with a crash, an accident at a ski resort in Utah back in 2016. Paltrow and another skier named Terry Sanderson smashed into each other on the slopes. Big question here, who hit who, right? Who was skiing uphill? In other words, who was responsible for the crash? In 2019, Sanderson sued Paltrow, saying basically it was her fault that she knocked him down and then just left. Sanderson says he got really hurt because of it. Brain injury, four broken ribs, some other serious problems. Listen. She knew that skiing that way, looking somewhere else, blindly skiing down a mountain by looking up and to the side was reckless. But Paltrow's attorneys countersued. They said, no, no, it's actually his fault. They say he crashed into her. That's why this is so he said, she said. Let's bring in Kathy Park, who's been following this. It is also kind of they said, because it is entirely possible that we're going to see Gwyneth Paltrow's husband, mm -hmm. her kids get pulled up. The second witness on the stand now is somebody who dated Sanderson before this happened. Each side is trying to frame their argument now as this trial picks up steam. Yeah, Hallie, that's exactly right. Um, kind of buckle up. This is just day one of what will likely be a week-long trial. And as you mentioned, there will likely be several witnesses um, and experts who will be taking the stand in the coming days. But today was day one. Uh, there were opening statements from both parties, and Harry Sanderson is a is a plaintiff in this case, and he is arguing, um, saying, look, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow crashed into me, and as a result of this skiing incident, he is suffering the consequences, and he has never been the same since. Take a listen. Before this crash, Terry was a charming, outgoing, gregarious person. He volunteered for many things. But after the crash, he's no longer charming. Uh, we also heard from Paltrow's attorney saying that that is not actually what happened. Sanderson actually crashed into her, and she was pretty upset about it. And uh, the attorney today was interesting. He actually pointed to some photos that were uh, posted on social media shortly after the incident. He also argued that Terry Sanderson took several trips after the incident. So he's arguing, hey, how could someone who has mm. a traumatic brain injury be doing all these things when he allegedly said... He was okay when he was checked on after this incident. Listen, I don't know what Gwyneth Paltrow's budget looks like, right? I know that she's very famous. She's got goop. She's got, I mean, she's, mm -hmm. she's pro could have probably have, have rather easily settled this, or at least, if not easily, at least could have settled this. But she, you know, is, is having this go to trial, even to the point where her family may end up taking the stand. And it feels like she is doing it based on some of the facts of the matter here that she'll lay out. She is doing this to sort of, defend her name in some ways to kind of make a point here that she's not going to she's not going to stand for this kind of thing. Yeah, she she wants to set the record straight. In her eyes, she did nothing wrong. In fact, she is the one who got hurt in the incident but decided not to press charges on this individual. You mentioned the long list of accolades. She is an award-winning actress. She has goop. She's also an influencer as well. It, I feel like whenever she says something, it seems to go viral. She wants to clear her name. This is something that has been dragging on for several years now, and she kind of wants to put it past her. Kathy Park, following it all for us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the New York Knicks. 
Losing a legend, Willis Reed died today at the age of 80. He led the Knicks to two championships back in the 70s and played for New York for all of his 10 NBA seasons. He was just recently honored as one of the NBA's top 75 players of all time for the league's 75th anniversary. Number two, back here in Washington, President Biden just created two new national monuments in the Southwest. That means the Spirit Mountain area in Nevada and the Kastner Range in Texas will be protected from new development. It's about half a million acres. Both sites are important ecologically, and they're considered sacred to dozens of Native American tribes. Number three, U.S. car regulators are looking into complaints from some drivers of the Honda Civic that their steering can kind of get stuck. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, says it's gotten more than 140 complaints about this. No reports of any crashes, but the agency says steering problems could make drivers, you know, overcorrect. That can be dangerous. Honda says it's going to cooperate with this investigation. Number four, Bad Bunny's ex-girlfriend just hit him with a $40 million lawsuit. You know why? This years-old recording of her voice that the singer has used in two of his songs. She's, she says, like, kind of Bad Bunny baby in this, like, breathy voice. She says that that's been used without her permission. She didn't get paid for it. Reps for Bad Bunny did not immediately respond to a message for comment. Number five, the FDA just gave the green light to Good Meat to sell its lab-grown chicken in the U.S., this brand, based in California, is now the second company to get the go-ahead on lab-cultivated meat, which means it's meat that doesn't require an animal to be killed. They've been testing out their products with street market vendors in Singapore for the last few years. So listen, we're seeing home prices down and home sales up, with numbers making history out today. We haven't seen a month-to-month -month sales spike like this since the surge at the start of the pandemic. And for the first time in more than 10 years, Housing prices are lower than they've been, right? I mean, this is like, it's only down 0.2%, but that's still the first time it's dropped in 12 years. Question is, does this mean it is a really good time to buy a house? Let me bring in Diana Olick, who covers all of this for us over at CNBC, our home price to like human being translator here. Um, what Those numbers are a lot. Put it into perspective for us. Is this people taking advantage of lower mortgage rates? Is this the housing market cooling off? What is this here? It's all of the above. Look, this has been what I have actually deemed a whack housing market. I'm sorry, there's no other way to put it. I mean, you've got really, Is really low it supply. Whack you've got actually really, kind really of whack? strong. I don't know. I'm I'm sorry. It just is. Again, you've got, you know, prices are starting to come down a little bit, but they're still very high because they jumped over 40 percent in the first two years of the pandemic. You've got really strong demand from buyers who want to get into homes. They can't find anything to buy. And we actually saw this massive jump in February home sales only because it was based on contracts signed in December and January when mortgage rates pulled back really sharply to 6 percent. Now they're back up, headed towards 7 percent again. And we'll find out from the Fed tomorrow if they go more. So it's really hard to say what this spring looks like, Hallie. We're also wondering um, about how the sort of Fed move that we expect to see tomorrow, raising interest rates at least a little bit, might play into some of this, Diana. Okay, so mortgage rates don't follow the Fed exactly, but they do follow what the Fed is thinking, if that makes any sense. How it feels about the economy, that's how investors decide whether or not to buy mortgage-backed bonds, and it sends the bonds up or down. So they do follow the yield on the 10-year Treasury. So they react to how they feel about the economy. So if the, Fed, if the Fed says that they still feel that the economy is still very, very hot, people might get nervous, they buy bonds, mortgage rates come down. If they start to say, well, you know, we're going to stall and they sound like they're not going to raise rates anymore, well, maybe people feel better about the economy. And believe it or not, in a counterintuitive way, mortgage rates might go up again. So it really depends on how the Fed feels about the economy and how investors react to that. That sends mortgage rates up or down. Make sense? Maybe. It sure does. Diana Ola, appreciate you. Thank you very much. When we come back here on the show, a comment made on the game show Family Feud could end up, could end up being evidence in a murder trial. If you can believe that, we'll tell you what the suspect's lawyer is telling our team tonight. NBC News is getting new details today about a possible defense from a guy in Illinois whose joke on a game show may seem to sound more ominous since he's now being charged in his wife's murder. We're going to show you the moment we're talking about here. This is from Timothy Bleefnick 
on a 2019 episode of Family Feud. You know Family Feud, you come on, it's hosted by Steve Harvey, you're like with your family or whatever. You guess the top answers to different survey questions. You see if you can guess the response that most people gave. Okay, Family Feud is supposed to be jokey. That's the vibe of Family Feud. It's supposed to be funny. Flash forward three years, police say that Bleefnik in February broke into the home of his wife, who he was estranged from by then, and shot her to death. Now, Bleefnik's attorney is speaking to NBC News just 48 hours before a grand jury convenes in this case. NBC's Maggie Vespa is joining us now. So, Maggie, I have to think that clip must have come up, right? What was the response to that from yeah. the attorney? Talk us through it and what else we're learning about how Bleefnik is going to try to prove that he didn't do it here. Yeah, we'll start with that clip, Hallie, because obviously that's the biggest part of this headline, the thing that's raising the most eyebrows. Bleef Nick's attorney, as you can imagine, very familiar with it. Again, she tells us that her client maintains his innocence from jail, where he is being held without bond in the murder of his estranged wife, Rebecca, in their Quincy, Illinois home last month. The same wife who four years ago, in 2019, he apologized to on Family Feud after giving that answer. And again, his attorney, very familiar with that clip. And this was her reaction. It's nothing. It is a game show. It is a silly answer to a silly question. And he it was an answer that was on the board. So I would really hope that a jury in our community would not convict somebody of first degree murder based upon an answer they gave on a game show four years before the murder. So again, Hallie, she was adamant. She wants to say that Bleefnik from jail maintaining his innocence and plans to plead not guilty. So that in mind, I asked her, what, if anything, does her client think happened to his estranged wife. And she said, you know, basically any number of things. She said this could have been, for instance, a burglary gone wrong. She says there have been a problem with prowlers in the area recently. So it seems like we can expect the defense to offer up sort of alternate theories as to what could have happened, which, as we know, they're not required to do but they often do to try to establish uh, doubt in the jury pool. Hallie. Right, the idea of reasonable doubt. Talk, talk through what we, what we do know, and there's not much of it about sort of the, the hard evidence in this case. Even the bond hearing where we might have seen a little bit more or gotten some clues or hints, if you will, was closed to the public when it happened. Um, talk us through what we know. Yeah, so it does seem like right now the prosecution and, and investigators and police are keeping a lot of their evidence under wraps, seemingly to try and not taint the jury pool at this point. But here's what we do know. We're told basically the couple was in the middle of a divorce, a contentious divorce. And during part of that, there were restraining orders filed back and forth that per Bleefnik's attorney have since been dismissed, but filed again between both spouses on both sides. Police calling this an instance of domestic violence. Also, Bleefnik's attorney saying that they, from what they've seen so far, see this as a largely circumstantial case. And they're calling for the prosecution, which we of course, can expect this down the line, but they want as soon as possible the prosecution to turn over everything like lab t uh, tests of the scene and the results of those tests. And his attorney, this is interesting, even called on investigators and prosecutors to test Bleefnik's Apple Watch, like getting down into the minutia of that to look at where he was and also his heart rate at the time the crime may have been committed. So they're really calling for all of that evidence to be turned over as soon as possible. Allie. Maggie Vespa, um, it, there's a lot to this. Thanks for being on top of it, Maggie. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, what we're learning about how a tick bite could maybe make you allergic to red meat. Plus, if you want to work at next year's Olympics in Paris, guess what? You might have a shot. We'll tell you what's going on coming up in The Global. Some new guidance out today showing that perhaps tick bites could make you allergic to red meat in some cases. This is a new thing that there is the alarm getting sounded on today that getting bitten by one of these little creepy crawlers could end up making you sick to your stomach because of this red meat allergy. It says the CDC says more and more people are getting sick from tick bites generally, especially in the Northeast. And this is coming at a time, of course, when weather is warming up. People are getting outside. That's obviously where the ticks live. I don't have to tell you. Uh, Dr. Akshay Sial is joining us now. Alpha-gal syndrome. We're seeing more of it. Explain that and what it does. So, Ali, alpha-gal syndrome, put simply, is an allergy to red meat that you can actually, our best guess is that it develops from a tick bite called a Lone Star tick. And um, so essentially, some people, you know, they get bit from this tick and about four to six weeks later, start to develop antibodies against, against the sugar in red meat. And this can cause things like, uh, you know, shortness of breath or, or hives, you know, typical allergy symptoms. But really what we're worried about today is, is stomach problems. Um, because I think a lot of people have stomach problems that their doctors just aren't figuring out what's wrong with them. They're being labeled as IBS or being dismissed. Yeah. And it's 
maybe all in your head. Or I'm like, oh, maybe you don't do well with like a lot of pasta at night or whatever. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like there's so many other ways to explain it away. Yeah. And so that, you know, the National Association really of, of gastroenterologists or stomach doctors came out today saying if you have a patient, maybe they're waking up in the middle of the night, just in terrible stomach pain, they're vomiting, they're nauseous, test them. It's a simple blood test. You can actually test for this allergy to red meat. Test them. It might mm. be explain what's going on here. What's also interesting is that unlike some other allergies, like I have a friend with a really bad nut allergy, right? That stuff, to, seafood develops right away. This is two to six hours after you eat the red meat. So you could be having, you know, a burger for lunch and then after dinner you start to feel sick. Yeah, it's two to six hours, which is really what's puzzling a lot of people. Because if you, if you go to a doctor and you say, you know, six hours after I ate something, I started to feel a little bit sick. They may say food poisoning. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going to run to say allergy, especially not allergy to red meat. Um, so I think that's kind of what's making this so hard to diagnose and really nail down the problem. Still pretty rare, right? It is. Um, you know, we are seeing more tick-borne illnesses, as you pointed out. But as of right now, it is still pretty rare. There is more awareness going on. As more awareness comes, we're probably going to start to see more cases here, too. What is the climate tick connection here? Because there is one. There is one. You know, ticks don't like to, they don't like going to, to cold places. Right. And so as the, as the climate gets warmer, you know, ticks are going to Canada, for example, where they're not normally are. And even in places they already are, they're actually spending more time outdoors, which means more, potentially more tick bites. Um, so as the weather gets warmer, we are probably going going to start to see more tick-borne illnesses, including Lyme disease, alpha-gal, um, and some others as well. Can you give us just the, like, news you can use reminder? Because even for me, I've been dealing with, you know, I'm outside a lot. Always check your body, right? Always check your hair lines, like all those things if you're out in long grasses. Same advice applies? Same advice applies. And, and for those worried about alpha-gal who, who may be diagnosed with this, you know, I called Dr. Scott Commons, who's the world expert. He actually discovered this syndrome. I called him. Well, and you, I just asked... call, you have his number? You just called him? <laughs> yeah, he's a friend. Um, <laughs> and so we spoke, and I asked him, you know, how are your patients? doing is it something are you never going to go to Shake Shack again like what's the prognosis right. here I mean he said three to five years is what most of his patients experience three to five years they can't eat red meat some can't even eat dairy wow. but if you if you if you're good about it you stay away from it there is a chance you could have that that burger again or that steak dinner again because it'll go away basically it'll go maybe away. after five years or so um, I would love a look at your phone <laughs> contact sheet uh, Dr. Sial, Dr. Akshay Sial. it's great to see you great to see you here in Washington we'll yeah. see you back on the show soon thanks NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're keeping an eye on in a new segment we call The Global. In Pakistan, you can see streetlights shaking after a 6.5 magnitude earthquake tonight. It hit in Afghanistan, but also shook parts of India. It killed at least nine people. Dozens of others are reported to be hurt. We're going to keep an eye on the story as it develops. In France, organizers for next year's Olympics in Paris are looking for 45,000 people to help out. They're launching a whole big push this week to recruit volunteers. So yes, you work for free, but you work at the Olympics. If you've got some free time next summer and you're into this, the application's open tomorrow. In Argentina, Messi mania is real. Check out this video showing soccer star Lionel Messi leaving a restaurant in Buenos Aires. When fans found out where he was, they rushed to try to catch a glimpse of him. Argentina is playing a sold-out, friendly game against Panama on Thursday. But still, that's bananas. I, he's just trying to eat. That's, that's a lot for Messi. So to come here on the show, why a Catholic group apparently spent millions of dollars on data from dating apps. We're going to talk with the reporter behind this story that links religion, privacy, all sorts of layered concerns. Coming up in the backstory, that's next. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, it's about new reporting on a group of conservative Catholics out in Colorado, pooling their money together, spending millions of dollars to buy software that tracks priests across the country who are using gay dating and hookup apps, and then turning around and reporting these priests back to bishops who are like basically the priests' bosses. It's part of a new Washington Post investigation with a lot of layers to it. Data privacy concerns, dynamics in the Catholic Church, the way the church teaches and treats sexuality and gender, the list goes on. But basically, this sits at the center of religion and privacy. Like, what information should and shouldn't stay private? And if what this Catholic group is doing could spread out, if you might start seeing, you know, copycats in other places... The organizers say the project's purpose is, and I'm quoting here, to empower the church to carry out its mission and give bishops, again, quoting here, evidence-based resources to help train priests. 
And what exactly happens to these priests they find on these dating apps? We don't know yet. The Catholic Lady and Clergy for Renewal, the nonprofit that obtained this data, did not respond to the Washington Post's requests for comments. I want to bring in Michelle Borstein, the Washington Post reporter behind this very uh, thoroughly reported, deeply reported investigation. Michelle, thank you for being here for the backstory. Sure. This really is a look kind of behind the curtain on how this reporting came together. How did you even get the, was it a tip? Was it an idea to look into this group and sort of what they were doing in the first place? Well, we had done some reporting almost two years ago about a, a Catholic website that outed a high-ranking Monsignor using data, and we didn't know where it came from. Mm. And we just wanted to know more about where did this data come from? Can you get this kind of data? It was kind of this collision of like data people and religion people yeah. that were like, what's going on with that story? Yeah, we just wanted to know how did they make this decision and what are they doing with the data and where did it come from and can that happen to anyone? But it's not like that stuff is publicly accessible information. I mean, this group, based on the reporting that you've done, seems to be pretty secretive here. Well, they were they were, have been very secretive. Like, they didn't want the priest to know that they had this data and that kind of thing. But what we learned from the reporting was that Really, there's not a lot of data privacy laws. They did spend upwards of $4 million acquiring and analyzing this data to try to match the, the dating and hookup app information with information from the bishops mm. that said this is where the priests live or hang out, et cetera, to, to try to identify them. But what we learned is that, you know, there's really, there's a lot of information about you that's still tracked mm. and that if you can get you know, certain elements, longitude and latitude and the phone ID number, et cetera, et cetera. If you have enough money, you can often find out, you know, you can find out who's behind it. Reporters are often talking with people about subjects that aren't like super easy all the time. But in this instance, it's, you know, it's religion, it's faith, it's homophobia, it's all, all these things that can be, um, that can be tough to get people to talk. How do you do it? How do you right. approach that as a reporter to get somebody to say, hey, let me have this conversation with you? Well, I mean, I've been covering religion since for about 17 years, so I feel like people know, like, I care about it, I prioritize, yeah. I understand the complexity of it. You speak the language. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that said, it's such a polarized time. The people who were behind this never spoke to me. And, um, but I think the reason that we were able to get so many people to share the details was because they, they understand how complicated morality is and conversion and... Mm sin and surveillance, and they wanted to get people to talk about it. They wanted it out. Mm. You saw a couple of these reports that bishops yeah. got about what apps priests were using. What was it like for you when you first saw that? Like, do you remember your reaction when you first kind of laid eyes on these documents? Um, yeah, I mean, in a way, it seems hard to, it, it's hard to believe in a sense, because it's the surveillance of this very intimate part of people's yeah. lives kind of like you said, this collision of very kind of matter of fact, black and white data about somebody. But what are you really measuring when you're talking about somebody's heart and their faith? Mm. So it was just like a, it was just a strange um, conversion of these two things. It was kind of jarring, but this is a, this is a part of the church for sure. Yeah. Um, Michelle Burstein, it's so good to see you and to have you here talking about this. I commend folks to your reporting and your team's reporting on the Washington Post. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for this hour. We'll have more of you here tomorrow. Same time, same place. Top story with Tom Young. Thomas, and I think Allison Barber filling in tonight picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.